My name is Megan Peters. I'm a cognitive neuroscientist at uh, the University of California, Irvine. And uh, after the last wonderful panel discussion, we now have three excellent short talks for all of you. So first we'll hear from Michael Winding. Then we'll hear from Nadine uh, Dykstra, and then we'll last hear, last but not least, from Alberto Antonietti. And so without any further ado, why don't we just go ahead right into the first short talk. Michael, take it away. Great. Okay. So can everyone see my screen? Looks beautiful. Go ahead. All right, great. So I am a research associate working with Marta Zladic and Albert Cardona at the University of Cambridge in the United Kingdom. And I'm going to present my work today on the complete insect connectum of a brain. Um, and this is what it looks like. Um, so I've been starting my talk lately with kind of a philosophical question, which is, if you had a comprehensive synaptic wiring diagram of a brain, would you be able to, based on that connectum alone, figure out the computations the brain performs to generate behaviors. Um, and so to get at this question, um, our groups chose the central nervous system of the fruit fly larva. And the reason we chose this animal is that the CNS is compact enough that you can effectively and quickly image it in electron microscopy with synaptic resolution, as well as reconstruct it. Um, and so at Genelia Research Campus, we made this electron microscopy volume of the CNS. And since then, we've been reconstructing the neuronal arbor and synaptic sites using an annotation tool called CatMate. Um, and at this point, we have reconstructed um, about, oh, sorry, about 3,000 neurons and about half a million synaptic sites. And um, this is what we get in the end. And to orient you, you're looking at the left and right brain hemispheres here, fully reconstructed, the subesophageal zone right below the brain, and then over here, the ventral nerve cord. And for those of you that aren't used to um, fly morphology, I mean, the brain you can think of as the brain, that's simple. But the subesophageal zone you can think of as the equivalent of the brain stem, while the ventral nerve cord you can think of as the equivalent of the spinal cord. Okay, so now that you're oriented, what makes this connectome special? First, because we've had this electron microscopy volume of the whole CNS for years now, many groups have been working on it in collaboration. And um, through this work, we've, at the beginning of this project, we already had reconstructed all sensory neurons and knew their modalities that go into the brain. Um, and because we have both brain hemispheres now reconstructed, we can look at comprehensive inner hemispheric communication. And finally, because these brain hemispheres are attached to a full CNS volume, we were able to reconstruct all descending neurons and see where they went throughout the, the nervous system. Um, and so with this connectum, we can follow sensory signal into the brain through the computations that are performed there. We can follow the behavioral outputs that are emitted by the descending neurons and even follow that signal sometimes to motor neurons which have been reconstructed in the nerve cord by many groups. Great, so as an overview of my talk, um, I'm gonna tell you about some cell types we've identified in the brain, as well as how information flows through them, as well as some novel circuit motifs to give you a sense of the kinds of analysis we can perform at this connectum. Okay, so first uh, I should say that we've already identified all input neurons into the brain. So the next thing we wanted to do is identify output neurons. So um, Already, Michael Pankratz's group has identified one type of output neuron called the ring gland neuron, which is responsible for hormone release. You can kind of think of this as the pituitary gland. Um, and here, we've identified and reconstructed all descending neurons to the brainstem equivalent and the spinal cord equivalent. And these neurons are thought to, and sometimes even proven to, be responsible for um, sending behavioral instruction to the rest of the nervous system. And they control many different behaviors, including feeding, swallowing, orientation, navigation, locomotion, as well as nociceptive behaviors. Um, and so at this point, we, we know the inputs, we know the outputs, um, but we don't really know what's going on in that black box in the center of the brain, these interneurons. Um, and it turns out they're actually the most numerous part of the brain. So there's many more interneurons than there are input or output neurons. 
Um, and so understanding these neurons is clearly key to understanding the computations the brain performs. And so the first thing we did is we tried breaking these inner neurons into chunks that we could understand. And in this case, we tried making cell types. Um, and so we looked at recent literature and we looked at circuit motifs that have been identified and established in that literature. Um, and I'm not gonna go into these motifs, but just to say that um, some of these are sensory projection neurons, as well as the innate center, the lateral horn, and the associative memory center, the mushroom body over here, as well as some decision-making centers. And so we, we took these circuit motifs, and now that we have a full brain, we identified the full set of neurons that engage in such motifs. And um, just to give you a sense of that, these are all of the different neurons we've identified. And so what does this give us in the end? So we, we now have a breakdown of the brain inputs. We know um, many different categories of brain interneurons, and we know the three brain output types. Um, so this is a great start. We can say something about almost every brain neuron at this point. However, we wanted to go even finer scale as well as do something a bit more unbiased. And so to do this, we collaborated with uh, groups at Johns Hopkins, namely Joshua Fogelstein and Carrie Preeb's group. And I'm gonna present to you Ben Pedigo's work here. Um, he gave a talk yesterday that I hope you're able to attend. Um, and so here on the left, you're seeing the morphology of the brain again. And here on the right, this is the first glimpse of the connectivity matrix of the brain. And so every little point you're seeing in this matrix is a specific um, synaptic connection between one presynaptic and one postsynaptic neuron. And when you look at it in its raw form, it looks pretty uh, unstructured. However, when we performed hierarchical structure uh, spectral clustering, we were able to pull out a lot of structure out of this connectome. And if you look at these dendrograms on the edge here, each leaf here is a particular cluster that we've um, made. And these clusters we found matched our cell type annotations quite well. So these colors you see are the cell types that I previously described. And the first thing we did is we sorted these clusters from the sensory periphery up here down through the brain towards the descending outputs here at the bottom. And the first question we had is what, how does information flow through these clusters, both in a feed forward sense, meaning in a chain from the sensory input down to the descending output, and in a feedback sense, meaning back up this chain towards the sensory input. And to do this, we looked at multi-hop signal between these clusters. Um, and this is what that looks like. I'm not gonna go into details about exactly what this plot means, except to say that the top right triangle is feed forward signal, while the bottom left triangle is feedback signal. And when we looked at feed forward signal, um, our first question was, is feed forward signal truly a simple chain from sensory input down to descending output, or is it something else? And so if it were this simple uh, model here, you would expect to see that most signal would be along um, this band right above the diagonal. And you do see signal there. However, we see lots of signal outside of this band too. And what this suggests to us is that feed forward paths are in fact multi-layered. So there's short paths between sensory and descending neurons, there's medium paths and long paths. And to confirm this, or to test this in a different way, we also looked at our cell types that we identified previously. And what we found is a very similar structure. So we found that sensory projection neurons, some of them directly talk to brain descending neurons. However, there are also many longer paths through the lateral horn, the, that innate processing center, as well as the mushroom body, the associative learning center, and a couple other higher order um, cell types that have been recently uh, published. Um, so we really think that these uh, feed forward paths are indeed multi-layered. So next we wanted to look at feedback paths, which again are this bottom left triangle here. And the first thing you can see is you can see lots of signal. So feedback seems to be a fairly common activity in the brain. I and mean, if we quantify the feedback versus feed forward signal, you see that feedback is robust across many brain clusters, but becomes stronger towards the descending neurons. And indeed, we found that descending neurons themselves emit feedback back to the brain. Um, and when we looked at this feedback, specifically with our cell type annotations, we found that this feedback went to many different brain regions. But interestingly, it went to dopaminergic neurons in the mushroom body input layer. And this is interesting because descending neurons are thought to emit behavioral instruction to motor neurons later on. 
Um, but this suggests that they may also emit an efference copy back into the brain, which could perhaps even be used as a teaching signal for things such as operant learning. OK, so that's how information flows through these cell types and clusters. Next, I want to tell you about a few novel circuit motifs, particularly in inner hemisphere communication, as well as brain nerve cord interaction. So because we have both brain hemispheres, we're able to identify all ipsilateral neurons, neurons that um, receive input and output on one brain hemisphere, bilateral neurons that output to both brain hemispheres simultaneously, and contralateral neurons, which output only to the opposite brain hemisphere. Um, we investigate these, investigated these in many different ways, but I just want to mention one very simple thing, which was when we looked at contralateral neurons, these neurons receive input on their brain hemisphere and output to the other brain hemisphere. And so there is a possibility that they could form reciprocal loops between brain hemispheres. And we indeed found that that was the case, that left-right um, homologous neuron pairs formed reciprocal loops with each other, specifically contralateral neurons. And we found that these loops were observed more often um, than expected by a null model. And so what we think now is depending on the sign of these loops, so if they're excitatory, these loops could be involved in signal propagation or even short-term memory, i.e. propagating a signal for a few seconds in the network. Um, and interestingly, many of these contralateral neurons are actually brain hubs, meaning they have many, many um, partners that they communicate with, suggesting they are indeed important for brain computations. Um, however, if these loops are inhibitory, they could be involved in interhemispheric uh, signal comparison. So this is something we'll be looking at into the, in the future. Um, and the last motif I want to briefly discuss is one involving descending neurons. So as we mentioned, sensory signal comes into the brain. Some kind of behavioral uh, decision is made. Descending neurons send this signal to the nerve cord where that behavior is enacted. Um, and we found when this sig signal is sent to the nerve cord, it's immediately bounced back via ascending neurons back to the brain. And it doesn't go just anywhere in the brain. It, in fact, talks to descending neurons themselves. Um, interestingly, though, we never found that a descending neuron and an ascending neuron made a reciprocal loop. This never occurred. Instead, what we found was that descending ascending neurons made these zigzag motifs, where one descending neuron would send some kind of behavioral signal to the nerve cord. That signal was bounced back to a completely different descending neuron, which theoretically would be enacting a different behavior. And so we think the zigzag motif could potentially be um, encoding uh, behavioral sequences. So in conclusion, I've told you a bit about brain structure, um, a bit about novel circuit motifs and phenomenon. And so what we want to do next is kind of close the structure function loop. So what are these different things that we observe actually doing in an animal? And to get at that, this, we're going to test um, functional imaging in the whole CNS, where we've been able to um, actually look at calcium traces in single cells and link that back to the connectome. Um, we also want to activate or inactivate individual circuit elements from the connectome in animals and see the effect on behavior, and then do targeted um, imaging with voltage sensors of circuits of interest. And in the longer term future, in my own group, what I would like to do is um, compare this wild type connectome to genetic mutant connectomes, particularly mutants that are important for neurological disorders. And then um, with my collaborators, I hope to identify circuits or motifs that display miswiring or defects, and then um, dive into these defects and see how are computations um, affected, um, and then look at functional activity as well as behavior. And in this way, we can kind of see how um, genetics and brain wiring are linked and also gain some insight into neurological disease. Um, thank you for your attention. I'd like to thank my advisors, Marta and Albert, as well as the primary collaborators on this project and my co-author, Ben Pedigo. And I'd like to also say now that this work is coming out soon, hopefully by the end of the year. Um, if you follow me on Twitter, you can um, hear more about it and you'll know exactly when the preprint comes out. Uh, thank you. Let me know if you have any questions. Because we can't actually clap, we will uh, we will clap for on behalf of everybody in the audience. Thank you very much for the really fantastic talk. We have a couple minutes for questions. Um, 
So uh, since there are no questions in the box just yet, I will take moderator's privilege and ask <laughs> you um, kind of a, a very specific question, which is uh, in that zigzag motif that you that you showed, what was yeah. the um, the target in the, the, the second or the ascending uh, kind of efferent copy? Is that a dopaminergic system or an entire dopaminergic circuit? You mentioned that you think that that's involved in operant conditioning and, and learning. Like uh, yeah, so you mean the feedback from the descending mm -hmm. neurons? Yeah, so there's a couple different types of these loops. So um, yeah, so that's just speculation at this point. We <laughs> do know that there are some descending neurons that talk directly to dopaminergic neurons that are known to be important for associative learning. Mm -hmm. So I, I, but no one has ever described these descending to dopaminergic connections. So there hasn't been really an investigation of how descending neurons, which are kind of command neuron types, can modulate these, these teaching signals. Um, and so that's something we'd love to look at in the future. Yeah. Very cool. Um, well, I, I do have other questions too, but I, I think I will have to save them because we would like to move on to our, our next speaker. But thank you very much, Michael, for the fascinating talk. Uh, and Great. thanks for the opportunity. Like to, yeah, if you'd like to continue the conversation, please let's move over also to the, uh, the Discord server and we can have some asynchronous conversations.